We never know where life will lead us or what may hinder us along the way. But while every day can feel like one big question mark, it doesn't have to. With the right insights, strategies, and solutions from Western and Southern Financial Group, together we can look ahead to leave the unknown behind. Buddy, what a weekend. I know you were on your deathbed. You could barely even make the serious show on Friday battling food poisoning. Meanwhile, while you're laying down, you know, struggling, fighting, yeah. such a good weekend. Isaiah Wilson on top of a car in the middle Sound of a strip bitch. mall. Quinn, oh, if you're watching good. on YouTube, please throw up the Isaiah Wilson clip right now. That happened. John Ross got signed by the New York Giants, and then their social media team forced him to do like a TikTok trend. We can pull that one up, Quinn, if you're watching on YouTube. That looked incredible. I also went five and one in beard eye this weekend without you new Son partner bitch. you're at my place too in my apartment complex. i was in your apartment complex just lighting it up but and then um there. you know it was just overall really solid weekend yeah i don't think i left my bed from friday night i leave in the middle of the serious show i was so hurting and good thing i did because i get back to my place and have a fever of like 102 i was i was on fire mm -hmm. uh and leave my bed until like sunday it was pretty bad so it was a fun weekend. I had a lot of fun. I think I got food poisoning because I realized I hadn't, I just got an air fryer. I realized I hadn't cleaned it out in like a week and I'd just been like frying chicken tenders in there. You know, That's as disgusting. one does. But That's disgusting. Yeah, I hate to. Also, highlight, I, I sent out a, a fire tweet on the horoscopes. You know, that always gets good stuff. And then I sent out the Roddy White tweet about Oral Roberts. It was a little too deep of a cut. I think I told you that. Yeah. It was like a, it was a unique tweet. Was Roddy hilarious. White. It was fucking uh, fantastic. Claim, making the claim that i don't know how he found out but that it's impossible to force someone to make you give you oral sex is what he said yeah uh, in light of the deshaun watson stuff yeah so man not not a great tweet from roddy and unsurprisingly yours didn't quite go to the moon but i i thought it was still a fantastic tweet yeah um i do think one another highlight of the weekend connor price sales guy here at pff is working the land of presenting sponsor for the oh, pod yeah. he's working with rover products i'm surprised people would want to work with us we're not a very are you serious sponsor friendly podcast we're sick I mean, we're smelling salts but you get me a rover those are the rover products are the ones who have the coolers the wheels on them yeah. i will be in this studio grinding it out i will do the entire podcast on one i won't even use a chair anymore i was gonna say i'm gonna ride that all summer long so i have my pool is right in my apartment complex on my floor just one long summer I ride. make it a dui riding that thing okay that's, that's why we're not fucking sponsor friendly you say shit like never that. driven drunk not gonna I've driven a Rover pretty t pretty fake. I mean, they don't make them have wheels for you not to ride them at least a couple times, a couple beers in. Yeah, around exactly. the pool? Exactly. Around the pool? Rover products, we're interested. We want it. I will do the entire podcast sitting on one. I'll do it. Fill them up with non-alcoholic beers. Oh, in January. Right. Let's go ahead and now jump into recently Lance Zerline of NFL Media, a guy who's been doing this for a long time. Friend of the podcast, too. We've had him on the show, I think. Um he, he dropped his position rankings on NFL.com along with his draft profiles, which I do think are like a really big sign that the draft is starting to heat up. Those draft profiles are loaded with a ton of information. Really good scouting terms, too. That guy has some okay. scouting terms that are pretty, pretty fantastic. My favorite one a few years ago, if you'll recall. He said Derwin James played through a straw. Was the Sometimes plays through a straw. Still don't know what it means. I don't know what that means. I think he, I think he tried to explain it once on the NFL. They had him on their NFL podcast, Sam and Steve. And I still don't get what it means. But I mean, I think it's, that's just it's, like, it's a good term, though. I Place like it. A straw. I, yeah. I, th I think I'm, I'm, I'm bored with it. All right, let's jump into these rankings here. Quarterbacks, little chalky, not nothing too wild yeah. there. He still has the big four as the same big four. Not a Chris Sims situation where he's kind of going off the beaten path. Mm -hmm. But um, where do you see some notables in the running back rankings? Yes, yeah, so the running backs, I think there's a tier of the top three people have come around on in some order. You're going to see Najee Harris, Travis Etienne, and Javante Williams as your top three. Then he has Trey Sermon, the Ohio State back, as RB4. And I like Trey Sermon a lot. Not RB4 for us. That is the highest I've seen anyone have Trey Sermon. But he's got a very NFL projectable skill set, I will say, Sermon. Like, you feel good about him once he gets to the NFL. He kind of reminds me of a 
Zach Moss, though, in that regard, and that it's like you feel good about him, you don't feel exceptional about him. Like you're never going to be – that guy's never going to get you too excited at the next level. But I think that's kind of this running back class after that top three. It's going to be – those are the three you want. Like last year, there was a tier of, we we're saying like five or six that you wanted. This year, it's a tier of three. We want to be the guy, if you really need a running back, draft the last one of that top of that top tier of three. And, and do you think ultimately we're going to see, I know there are some people who like the draft prop that Javante Williams, the UNC running back, will be the first running back off the board. Plus you, 400. Yeah, do you think like people, do you think he has a legitimate chance to go number one over all the running backs? Yeah, because I, I don't think, well, one, He's a lot younger than the other guys. I think teams will factor that in, the mileage sort of thing. Teams don't want guys with a ton of carries on their body. And Javante Williams has, obviously, the fewest of those top three. He's only a true junior coming out. And teams also don't really care about, basically, the hype. Teams are going to do their own scouting. They don't care that you were uh, you know, the biggest name in college football for the last two years, like Etienne and Najee Harris. If your tape this past year was the best tape, and honestly, it's hard to argue against Javante Williams. That's why he's RB2 for us. His tape was exceptional this past year. So I could see that being, I could see him come off the board first. All right, let's jump to now Lance Zierlein's wide receiver rankings. What kind of blew you away here? So two big things here. I think that he has, he has the top three is the top three. They're the same. He has Devontae Smith at one. Uh, like I said, those three, put him in anywhere you want. Just draft one of them. The That being Jamar Chase, Devontae Smith, Jalen Waddell. But Go down a little bit more. He is low on Rashad Bateman. He has Nico Collins from Michigan, who opted out this past year above Rashad Bateman, which, whew, I can't get on board with that one. But then he kind of wins me back by having Kay Johnson, the South Dakota State wide receiver, wide receiver 10. Thought we were the only ones high on Kay Johnson, but he's in the same tier as us in terms of how high he is on your boy. Dude, Kay Johnson love. We can't, I mean... Talk talk to, for those who don't know about Kay Johnson, South Dakota State Kay wide Johnson. receiver, what, what, what do you like about his game? He had the high what he had the highest grade in the one on ones at the senior bowl during the week of practice of any wide receiver there. Now, that's not end all be all. That's like 15 reps. But if you're getting open against NFL future NFL corners, that's usually a good thing when you can do that. Ridiculously productive on tape. Obviously, over 1,200 yards each for his past two seasons. Had to opt out this past year. But what I love, the biggest thing with me is his suddenness and the way he just gets off the line of scrimmage and can play through contact. At Senior Bowl, there was a rep against the safety. Off the top of my head, I can't remember exactly who it is. But he... It was Christian Uphoff. Uphoff. Like five yards off coverage, and he gets chucked, like, wholesale, just hammers him. But then Kay Johnson still gets on top of him and stacks him. Like, play, gets right through it, barely loses any speed. A lot of the smaller slot-type wide receivers, you worry about those guys. Having to play through contact in the NFL, having to avoid linebackers, and then still being able to get into their routes... I don't worry about the K Johnson from what I saw on his tape. Now, catch radius is a real concern. Shrimps are, there's a reason they look a lot cooler in college than they do in the NFL oftentimes. It's because like it is more difficult to hit a guy who is five foot 10, like K Johnson, than it is a guy six two. It just is. Yeah. Those guys have a, those guys are higher to begin with. Those guys just have a bigger catch radius. That just is a thing that matters, especially over the middle of the field. So that's going to be a, his biggest like weakness, but as a route runner, his ability to get open, he's very good. Some other notables from Lance Airlines wide receiver rankings. Like you said, he's low on Rashad Bateman, has guys like Tylen Wallace and Nico Collins ahead of Rashad Bateman, but he's also low on Rondell Moore. He's got Josh Palmer and Demetri Felton over Rondell Moore, looking a little Ooh. bit further down the list. He's Ron also okay. Rondell Moore's 2020 tape was not good mm -hmm. compared to his years past. Just like scrap that, throw it out the window. He had whatever injury, is it a hamstring that he had, nursing. Then he came in, he looked over, he looked out of shape, to be honest, was not as fast. 2020 tape, not great. 2019 tape, his athletic testing, you can, that's the guy we saw. That's the guy I'm banking on getting at the next level, not the guy we saw in 2020. Some other names here that like I think we've mentioned a ton on this podcast that are a little bit higher in our rankings that he is lower on. It looks like he's got like Austin Watkins, Dwayne Eskridge, Frank Darby ahead of guys like Tutu Atwell. Um, we're not high on that. We're not high on that. Well, you're right, I guess. But Jalen Darden, Jalen Darden's below Smith, Seth Williams on this list. I mean, he is, he's very low on time. Um, and that's Jalen just Darden. opposite ends of the catch radius spectrum. Yeah. And Darden's a guy who's like, again, he's going to look a lot cooler in college than he is in the NFL because like the windows are tighter down the field than in the NFL. You're, you don't have that space to work with uh, at the second level, oftentimes like behind the linebackers in front of, safeties like 
you have to be able to one play through contact there and two you know hauling off target passes because like when you sit down in a zone a lot of times it's you got to be on the same page as your quarterback and the guys who can adjust better give you a better window for your quarterback at his size is he ever going to be able to adjust to those passes i don't know maybe maybe not but uh still he just offers a little bit more athletic a little bit more a lot more athletically than seth williams i think seth williams just kind of limited him Going to his offensive tackle rankings, I find this, you know, he's he and now Daniel Jeremiah are big on Rashawn Slater as the top offensive tackle in this class. By a hair, though. Yeah, but it's by a hair. hair. Uh, he has, so they have a uh, quantitative measurement for their grade, their draft grade, 6.74 for Rashawn Slater, 6.73 for Panay Sewell. And then there's a pretty significant, relatively significant drop off to Christian Darisaw as his third favorite offensive tackle or third ranked offensive tackle. Tevin Jenkins comes up for what I found interesting is. Third best interior offensive lineman, according to Lance Airline, Quinn Miners, Wisconsin Whitewater. That is really impressive. Coming into the senior bowl, that guy has made himself some money. Oh, yeah. And I and his pro day was insane. He had a really good pro yeah. day. 320 pounds, and his numbers were pretty comparable to Tristan Worse. Like, not enough. I mean, I don't think enough people were talking about his pro day. Everyone and their mother was talking about his senior bowl. But, like, his pro day was legit, like, oh, shit. Yeah. Like, this is, his pro day was basically the icing on the cake of, hey, this is real. Like, you know, I'm not. I'm not just a nice storyline here. I am basically Ali Marpet level of prospect yes. coming out. You know, Ali Marpet, great senior bowl, but then solidified it when he goes to his pro day and tests out like freak athlete. That's mm -hmm. Quinn Miners, great senior bowl, solidifies it when he goes to his, because that's, you know, whatever you want to say that still has value, athletic testing in terms of leveling the playing field when you don't get a level playing field, when you're seeing this guy go on tape against guys who aren't going to be playing in the NFL. So I think that's a big w for him and i would be like always say into your office lineman three in his rankings yeah it wouldn't surprise me that's how it plays out come draft time you think he goes as high as the second round yeah i do Man. and that's where marpet went i would not be surprised at all dude that would be a hell of a hell of a jump for quinn Miners. some other notables here on his offensive tackle rankings he has liam eichenberg of notre dame stone Forsyth of florida who actually Ooh. grades really well in pff system he's one of the highest graded pass protectors on true pass sets this past year then alex leatherwood over guys that we like a ton dylan radins of north dakota state sam cosme of texas and even then jackson carmen a little bit further down he has him listed as a guard we haven't talked at all really about stone Forsyth. what's your opinion of his yeah. name i mean he's a high cut dude listed at six foot nine but he's he can move for a guy that tall kind of reminds me of it, but not necessarily powerful like leatherwood's a much more physical impo physically imposing offensive tackle so that one's kind of more in the eye of the beholder like i think forsyth could profile better to pass protection though at the nfl level if he just it needs to get a little stronger gotcha all right let's now jump to his defensive ranks here i'm gonna go to the defensive line i think it's interesting that he has edge one Jason Oway of Penn State. You'd think I was going to think that PFF would be the highest on Jason Oway because his his pass rushing grades and stuff are good. His sack numbers aren't great at all. Like he mm -hmm. barely had any sacks at Penn State, but he graded well in bits, specifically on true pass sets, and also is a freaky, freaky athlete with that explosiveness and that burst. Lance Zerline, edge one, Jason Oway of Penn State. He also, though, sees them very similar in his grades where there's like a all those guys are almost in the exact same grade. Yeah, true. Tier. Like they're all super close in his rankings. And, that, and that's how that's how it is in this year's class. Like that just is what these guys are. No one really has anything that separates themselves. Like Aziz Ojolari has the best probably on field tape and performance, but then he is a unique rusher and a unique case and profiling to the NFL and what he brings to the table. Whereas the other guys are like always built in the fucking lab. Mm -hmm. And he also like he graded out fairly well. Yeah, like in terms of just, specifically like, against what, run, you talk yeah. about his run defense grade improving this past year. I think that's a big yeah. testament to his ability. I wanted to speak to how close they were in his rankings, real quick. Jason Owe in his quantitative measurement six point four four. Then he has Aziz Ojulari of Georgia at six point four two. Quiddy Pay of Michigan at six point four. Gregory Rousseau at six point three nine, and then Jalen Phillips at six point three seven. All like within yeah. what point oh six or point oh eight grading mm -hmm. points. Like that's what this edge class is. Pick your flavor, but also pick them early because you're not going to find freaks like those five guys yeah. after the first round you're not yeah see i i just like i prefer pay and away because one they truly are out of this world level athletes like not every year sort of athletes in terms of what they bring to the table and then two like we've seen the upper progression they have and they have you know valid excuses for why they didn't perform as much on the football field pay coming from uh you know small school high school football where he played running back then going to Michigan and playing defensive line. Owe 
literally only starting playing football in what 2016 mm -hmm. that those are legitimately why you would be raw and then to see them progress the way they have throughout their college careers yeah none of these i don't think any of these guys are going to hit the ground running no, no one's going to be chasing very day true. one but what am i banking on who am i who do i want three years from now is basically what i'm drafting in this edge class i want the guys who are ridiculous freaks who have improved every single year something also pretty notable about his edge rankings he's really high on charles snowden 6.22 in yeah. his grading that's high i i was we have or significantly lower on charles snowden but i want to move to defensive tackle he is one of the few draft analysts that actually view the defensive tackle class like we do yep. and that christian barmore is an arm and a leg better than any other defensive tackle in this class right now he's the number one ranked defensive lineman at 6.7 for perspective his top edge jason Owe is 6.44 and then you don't see a defensive tackle until levi muzurike further down the list at 6.31 it's christian barmore and then everybody else yeah everyone shits on this defensive tackle class but barmore is in my opinion as good a prospect as kinlaw and brown were coming out last year wow. his tape this past year was better than any other defensive lineman in college football you know, it, it was the best. It was better than any of these edge guys. Now, is he, he's not as freaky as Owe or like some of these edge guys, but he is a darn good athlete in his own right and a very flexible 315 pounder with his ability to play with leverage at his size. So I think Christian Barmore, I don't want to say getting slept on, but like I, the zero line see, sees it in a similar way that we see it. And that this guy's a darn good player. He is the best defensive lineman like on tape right now in this draft class. And that, because the rest of the DTs suck. Like if you're gonna need, if you're gonna draft one, I think I had him going to the Titans in the first round of my latest oh, nice. mock draft today. With Jeffrey Simmons, I kind of like that. Which like they obviously wanted to re build through their trenches defensively and kind of just skirted their entire secondary. I think someone's gonna draft him top twenty to twenty five picks in this year's draft. All right, jumping to linebacker now. Bar none. By the way, I, I meant to make this part more. Bar none. Bar more. I don't know what the fuck I was going to say. Is Something there like more that. to that? I think that's all I had. Uh, uh, anyway, that, I'm going to just workshop that one. You probably shouldn't have said, just like dropped it right there. <laughs> oh my God. This is why we're not sponsorable. Um, linebacker. I found this interesting. So his top linebacker is Micah Parsons with a 6.89 grade. And then Jeremiah Wusu koromo is right after him. And I've seen him comment on Twitter a handful of times to people about how much he really does like Jeremiah Wusu koromo But then there's a significant drop off after... Parsons at 6.89 and Owusu Kormo at 6.82 to Zayvon Collins in the 6.3 range, Nick Bolton in the 6.3 range, and then Jabril Cox at 6.26. Do you see a similar drop off between those talents? Shit, I really wasn't listening. I was trying to come up with like a pun for the Barmore thing. Jesus Christ! About what? I was my, I was workshopping something like, now that COVID's gone, you're gonna want the Barmore. You need to go. You need to leave. That was worse than mine. <laughs> Good thing we have three more pods this week. Yeah. You guys got three more cracks at this. This the is bar just, Let's just shelf it for today. <laughs> yeah, shelf it for today, and we'll come back tomorrow. I'm glad you spoke up, Quinn, by the way, because it was a good opportunity to bring this up. Kenny Galladay signs with the New York Giants. You owe us a bottle of salts here. I yeah. do. I told you guys before the pod that Purchase it's them. on the way. Let's go. 100 count. I also, for the salt today, I went both nostrils at the same time. Usually, I isolate a nostril. The double nost is is a bold move. I hit one and then the other. Yeah, I think I should have done that because I was kind of seeing stars for a little bit. Um, but anyway, what my question was before you're workshopping a garbage pun, Micah Parsons, Jeremiah, Jeremiah Wusu Kormo, according to Lance Zerline, are like the top two linebackers in this class at 6.89 and 6.82. Yeah. Then there's this significant drop off yeah, to Zayvon Collins, Bolton, and Jabril Cox. Do you see it similarly? Yeah, I do. Now, I, I think Bolton will be a very good NFL linebacker. I don't think he'll ever be close to the Bobby Wagner that tier where uh, is like the difference maker tier. It's kind of like at tight end, there's that tier of three linebacker. There's probably a tier of like four or five at this point of guys who are like, they move the needle no matter what scheme, no matter where they are, cover Jan against the run. Like those guys are good. I don't think Bolton's ever going to be in that tier, but I think you're going to get a really solid linebacker for the next, you know, however long he's playing. Like he is a guy that can execute against in coverage and against the run at the NFL level just may not give you that high-end play. So I do see it similarly where those are the two guys. If you want one that's going to be an all-around everything elite tier of linebacker, Owusu Koromoa or Parsons are the two guys I see being able to reach that tier in this class. All right, I'm going to jump to defensive backs now, which I find interesting. He has Patrick Sertan as his number one corner at a 7.02 grade. Rarely see prospects in that seven range. And then a massive drop-off over a 0.5 grading points drop off to J.C. Horn as his cornerback two, and then Caleb Farley as his cornerback three, Newsom, then Tyson Campbell. Those are his top five cornerbacks and his top five defensive backs in this class. Yeah. Reactions to that? He sees Sertan 
in rarefied area. I mean, that's a top five prospect for him in the class. Yeah. Um, that's a Pro Bowl grade he's give, given Let's him. See if he's got any good scouting terms. He doesn't have anyone else close to that tier, which is interesting. I, I think a lot of people have seen this top group of cornerbacks as almost a tier of three in the J.C. Horn, uh, Caleb Farley, and Patch Sertan, and that it's kind of pick your flavor based on the scheme you want to run, where you want it, where you want this guy to play in your defense, sort of thing. He's basically saying, hey, Sertan, and if you want a cornerback, it's going to be him. That's the guy you want in this class. I don't necessarily agree, but I do think I kind of see Sertan as that super high floor guy. If you're, He is going to be a solid NFL cornerback, and I think that still obviously has a ton of value. So I do I do really like Sertan's game. I'm not knocking him whatsoever. I think he's like 12th on our board. So. Oh, yeah, not at all. Yeah, Sertan is still yeah. very talented. But I just I don't, <clears throat> I don't see that gap that he does. Gotcha. And then I, I wanted to speak to the safety rankings that he did have. I'm scrolling up here a little bit. Um, he had Trayvon Morgue as his number one safety, as we do. But there's not that big of a gap. You know, we see a pretty significant gap between Trayvon Morgue and the next best safety. He has Jamar Johnson of Indiana as his safety two at 6.30. And Trayvon Morgue as his Elijah, safety one at 6.35. Or Elijah Molden. Yeah, he, Elijah Molden. Because we call him Elijah Molden the safety, which he's he lives in that corner. He's never going to play outside corner. So that that a slot corner for us is more akin to safety, but he's kind of got a, they're all jumbled up here mm -hmm. with Javon Holland as well in that mix and divine Diablo, not too far off either. Uh, I'd love, love two names here that he has like ranked considerably highly that we haven't talked about a ton on this podcast. Jamar Johnson of Indiana, his safety too. And then Shakur Brown, the outside cornerback for Michigan state. I still got to get Jamar Johnson's tape this week. We're going to watch him for the Monday. You'll be one of the last guys. Still have to hit safeties. My last mm -hmm. position before That's your last position? Monday, New draft guide drops. So we'll see about Oh, drops. man. Are you ready for the new draft guide? New draft guide. Final, 300 profiles. Final, final one. draft guide. It's going to be profiles, sick. Pro day information. Team pages. You've been grinding. It's been a grind to get that up. Mm -hmm. But all right, that's going to do it for Lance Erlein's rankings here. Let's go ahead and jump now to our positional overview for the running back and tight end position. Always good to look at what other people are doing and how other people see the class. That is valuable information as well. People talk about the evaluation process. And it's obviously watching the tape. Talking to players, if you can, looking at pro day information or any measurable testing that you can get. I think it's also part of the evaluation process should be seeing how other talented or elite minds in the space see the class. Because that's going to help you. That's information you can gather. And I think you'd be stupid as a front office to put together a scouting team and not at least look at what other, how other people are seeing the class. Because if odds are, say you're an analyst and you're in a vacuum or a phone booth, yeah. either one. And you're like, I see X player as the best safety in this class. And no one has them in their top five. There's probably a good chance you're doing something wrong. Or at least there's an opportunity to reevaluate your process and gain more information. I don't think you should ever scout or evaluate talent, especially in the draft, in a vacuum. Oh, no. I, I think questioning yourself and what you saw is valuable. And, and having someone else question it. Yeah. Uh, just like having your opinion question on like any topic is valuable. Like You shouldn't only have yes men and only have the people in your circle ever giving you just advice don't scout in a vacuum so don't scout in the phone booth I, I recommend scouting like at a desk it's probably your best bet but Eat shit <laughs> all right let's get to the running backs here we're gonna start with day one you just wrote in lol explain I that. did write lol that's our that's it's like uh i think eric eager's answer is the best answer to this question how oh. high would you take the best running back in his prime. So he said, so someone asked him, like, Adrian Peterson mm -hmm. in his prime. How high would you take Adrian Peterson in his prime? And he said, pick 33. You know, right at the top of the second round, make sure I get a viable position with that fifth-year option, with that cost-controlled tr contract in the first round. But at the top of the second round, when it all becomes four-year deals, I would take Adrian Peterson in his prime. And I think I can get behind that answer. I can get behind the idea of, like, hey, I would take Adrian Peterson at the top of the second round, knowing that mm -hmm. it's not going to be that much of a needle mover compared to bringing in some, and it all comes back to not just valuable positions on the football field it comes back to the the market valued positions the ones that get paid a ton the highest paid running back in the nfl doesn't even make close to what like the 10th or 15th best edge defender makes i'm sorry yeah. and that again comes back to like you're playing the market you know if and i think george has made this analogy in and out's fire and i get that but if you can get it for five bucks but someone's telling you you could also get it for 30 bucks. It's good, but you don't have to spend 30 to go spend the five. Or you can just go to Steak and Shake. Or you can go to Same Steak thing. and Shake. Yeah, I know there's a lot of people, non-Californians, who like hate on In-N-Out because it gets like propped up as like the best fast food chain. I think it's good. Very good. From California. I Solid. Agree. 
but it's like comparable to Five Guys. It's yeah, comparable to Five other Guys good burger good stores. Too. I made burger stores. It's comparable to other burger chains. There are some Californians who are like, if you eat anything but in and out, you're a sick piece of shit. It's like, no, that's not the case. It's good. Not as hyped up. It is good. And the fries actually stink. The fries aren't that good. I agree. They, like, you have to get, they, there's a reason you get the animal fries. You have to yeah. cover them in other shit for them to be good. It is probably the best fast food burger I've had, but it's also like Five Guys is close in my opinion. Yeah, it's very um, close. All right, and it's a more nuanced conversation. There's like other. The thing is, it's not just that it's, um, like there's a there's a handful of knocks about why you shouldn't draft a running back. One, you mentioned it, the cost savings, and and you're not just drafting in the first round in a vacuum. Like you don't just oh you pass on say you pass on Adrian Peterson. That doesn't mean you couldn't draft a good player. Like there you do it because you can draft other good players. Uh. It's also the argument of how long is this going to get to be in a roster? If you draft a different position, if you draft you know, Julio Jones top five, you draft a wide receiver top five, quarterback, uh, offensive tackle, that guy can be on your team for 15 years, 12, 15 years. Yeah. Running back is not going to be on your team 12, 15 years. You have that stat. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a running back is going to be on your team five, six years, max, especially at this point in time. And then kind of the last point of the argument is you're drafting a running back somewhat highly. It's behooving you or it's incentivizing you that's a better word it's incentivizing you to give him touches yeah when everything says all the data points to you want to be passing more in early downs than teams are even still doing in the nfl that it there's we i don't think any team has hit that sort of break even point of calling run versus pass on first downs where it helps you to continue to call passes and so when you draft a running back it negatively impacts your play calling and makes you a worse team in that regard. Yeah, you might be a better runner, but you're a worse team. It was kind of like that when the Packers were, uh, or no, it was, it was it was the game, the Bucks against the Chiefs. The Bucks were more efficient running the ball on first down, more efficient passing the ball on first down. The Chiefs were more efficient on first down because they passed way more. That is, that's kind of the whole thing about uh, why we say the run pass sort of breakdown. You don't want to be running the ball more. You want to pass the ball more. So in, So invest more in the passing game. That all kind of yeah. combine all that mess that I just tried to put out there. That's why we say like running back value, you're not going to get in the first round. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's very similar to like somewhat interior offensive line value. I mean, there's some of that. There's some of yeah. that in the first round. It's like, hey, it's not to the extreme of don't take a long snapper in the first round, even if it's the best of the position, <laughs> but it's it's similar in that like some positions, as good as you are. But running backs are paid closer to long snappers than they are top edge. Exactly. Top running backs. Very are true. And some recent news over the weekend that kind of pays into this, Chris Carson signed a two-year, $14 million deal to still be the starter over former first rounder Rashad Penny through the extent of his rookie contract. They essentially lit that first round pick on fire. Like uh, that is obviously wor not worse than Isaiah Wilson's situation. You know you have to have two quality backs in the NFL today though. So, and another thing too, Las Vegas Raiders spent a first round pick one of which that they got while trading Khalil Mack a valuable player at a valuable position and then just signed Kenyon Drake to a two year 11 million dollar guaranteed deal and they're going to use him as this joker and use him as a receiver and as a running back but like I thought that's what they drafted Lynn Bowden for it was what they drafted <laughs> Lynn Bowden for but like again you go back to valuable use of resources if you can sign a Chris Carson or a Kenyon Drake to this contract, it's like, why Why are you drafting running backs in the first round? And someone said to me when I was making fun of the pick on Twitter, wait till you see Josh Jacobs get hurt. That's when this is going to show up. No, that's going to make John Gruden look like a bigger ass because Kenyon Drake, who signed off the street, is going to come in and do the same level of production as Josh Jacobs. And you spent a first round pick on the kid. The wait till you see Josh Jacobs get hurt is the same energy as, oh, we can get out of this contract in two years. Yeah, With the, it's very the free, agent, the free agent we just signed, we can cut him in two years. That's, okay, perfect. NFL yeah. fandom continues to surprise me. I mean, the, you know, it, it, it's it's crazy. It's wild. Uh, the other thing, I, I, I was reacting to this as you were speaking. So Devontae Smith is not choosing not to do any of the drills at the pro day, but he told media he's only doing height and weight and his weight is 170. I know we said we're not overreacting to weight. That's six foot one, 170 is that is one of the thinnest receiving prospects I've ever heard of. Ever heard of. Seen? Yeah. Heard of. S Trey Walker weighs more. Yeah. That's wild. That I mean, and Trey Walker's shorter, too. I know. Like that's what I'm saying. A, he's a slim reaper. Like, that is as... That guy steps off. Like I, I want to oh see God. what he does in the <laughs> wait, weight room. Wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry. <laughs> Josina Anderson just quote tweeted and said, that's 40 pounds more than me. <laughs> Nice. That's incredible. Just seeing Anderson um, coming in with the perspective. That's a. I just want. What does he do in the weight room? I'm very curious. Yeah. Or what does he eat? That is what I'm more curious about. Yeah. Okay. Again, I'm not going to overreact to it. You can still have success in the NFL. He had a ton of success at Alabama. 170 pounds. What I will say, what is factual, that is the lightest 
six foot one person I've ever seen go into the NFL. Yeah, easily. Yeah. I think punters way more. That is Slim Reaper. Yeah, I mean season. that's that's a kicker. That's a that's a good size kicker. That is a great size. Do kicker. you guys think you could bench more than Devonte Smith? How much right can you now? bench? <sighs> Not a lot. Maybe like. What's your record for two twenty five? Uh, my record two twenty five was nine. Oh wow! Like a few years ago though. I did six once. Okay. But I have short ass arms. I could probably do like four now. Jared Aberdeer size. What was, was that last yeah, name? Jared Aberdeer Ab- four. <laughs> Wisconsin. Jared All right, let's go to the running backs now. No more Devontae Smith. No more making fun of the Kenyon Drake selection. Or not selection, investment. Uh, number one running back on PFS board. And I've seen him as the number one running back on others. I think it's a closer class than people want to give it cre- to give credit for. I think a lot of people say it's Dodger Harris and everybody else. Yeah. Travis Etienne of Clemson, PFS number one back. Yes. Biggest pro in the draft, guys, is his burst. And man, it shows up everywhere. He'll catch he'll catch like a little hitch, you know, a little something over the middle of the field. And as soon as he turns up field and goes, it just it looks different than any other running back in this class when he just wants to get going from a stand still. I think the biggest con for him, running stylistically, he gets a little big play happy. He will bounce. He will get lateral to the line of scrimmage too much. Much, not necessarily your prototypical north-south guy so the comp for him in the draft guide is a more elusive lamar miller now lamar miller in his prime was a very good back in my opinion 55 carries travis Etienne of 20 plus yards over the course of his college career the next closest in the entire draft class michael carter with 42 he was just the best big he is the best big play threat in this draft class he completely overhauled his game he got made fun of Early on in his Clemson career, he would get made fun of in practice for how bad he was as a receiver. Showed up his sophomore year. I think his sophomore year was his junior. Showed up his junior year as his junior to spring practice saying, I want the rock. I want to be throwing the football. Use me in the passing game. I'm going to do whatever it takes. This past season, as a senior, highest receiving grade in the country. Things you love to see, that kind of work ethic, putting in, knowing that it was a weakness of him, now making it a strength for him. That's why... All things to love about Travis Etienne and why he's running back one. I am a big fan. I'm a big fan of Travis Etienne's game. I don't think I, I don't think again, it depends on what flavor running back you also want too. I do think yeah. Travis Etienne, you can't you can't go in and say he's the best running back, and that's the running back I would take first no matter what. It's like, yeah. okay, what do you want at the position? Because Travis Etienne versus this next guy we're gonna talk about, Javante Williams, UNC, those are pretty close to being completely different backs. Like Javante Williams is an absolute yeah. Pounder between the tackles type of guy, and I don't think he. Had, John, Javante Williams doesn't have the Travis Etienne home run speed. Like he doesn't have that same top speed. But Javante Williams is going to lower his shoulder, break a ton of tackles, and be that you know that needle mover for you. He kind of reminds me in some ways his game. And I don't think you're going to like this comp. I, Jamal Williams at BYU was a load. I, I feel like Jamal Williams at BYU was a was a good player. He has a, he's not maybe not the same player. To Javante Williams. Yeah, you're saying Javante Williams to Jamal Williams. You're just last name scouting. I'm last name scouting. But you have, I think you have his comp, or you've comped him to Aaron Jones in the past. Bigger Aaron Jones. It's the violent running style. I mean, Aaron Jones runs about as he he will get up to top speed between the tackles. More so, like smaller backs. Aaron Jones like 205. You don't see that a lot from smaller backs to get up to full speed to run as hard as they can into a guy. Like he will go, he will hit a linebacker at full speed, and I think that's kind of the. Aaron Jones' biggest strength is, yeah, he's a super explosive dude, tested out really well coming out of UTEP. What was it? What was it UTEP? It was UTEP. And he'll lower that shoulder into a defender. That is Javante Williams. He will hit you at full speed, not try to shake you. He will go and lower that shoulder because he knows he is more explosive than you are. And it's, that's why he broke, that's why he broke the PFF record for force missed tackles per attempt. 76 broken tackles last year, 159 attempts. Biggest pro in the draft, guys, is violent running style. Biggest con is really just workload at this point. You know, only 150 attempts was his, 157 attempts was his career high. Not utilized a ton in the passing game, even though I think he can do it really well. That's just what happens when that guy is 25 carries in. Is he winded as shit? Is he not a different player altogether? Remains to be seen. That's usually a pretty low concern, though, on my list of concerns. If I'm if that's your biggest concern for running back, that was Josh Jacobs' biggest concern. Has it meant a damn once he got to the NFL? So there you have it. You're not concerned about his top speed at all. It's not elite. I, I think he can hit home runs though. Still, that like, I mean, he's more he's faster than you know, like Kareem Hunt. And Kareem Hunt was hitting big plays left yep. and right when he was with the Chiefs. So I don't, I don't think it's that. It's not something 
It's not something a lot of guys can rely on at the NFL. It's a nice thing to have. You have to be rare. And that's how I, that's how I feel about Travis Etienne. Like he has that rare speed and explosiveness to consistently do it at the NFL. There's only like not a lot of guys get by on that alone. Like Adrian Peterson, Chris Johnson, the list is small of guys that that is something you could rely on as big plays from them in the running game. Javante Williams also, you know, led the nation in force missed tackles per temp this past year at 0.48. And people forget this. He's only 20. Javante Williams is 20 years old and still like developing. I think a lot, you know, Michael Carter, when I talked to him on the podcast, and that's actually on today's podcast, that, that interview drops on today's podcast. So listen, one of the first thing Michael Carter brings up is like, because I talk about like, explain Javante Williams game. He's like, the dude's 20, like doing what he's doing at 20 years old doesn't make a ton of sense. And he also brought up a hey, valedictorian, super smart guy. Mm-hmm. I think he had like over a 4.0 in high school, almost didn't consider going to play football, was going to just do academics somewhere else. Like what a loser. <laughs> Does he love the game? I don't know if he loves Is the game. Is it worth asking? No, we but have I, 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 I do think where? that Javante Williams' age, his force miss tackle stuff, the yards after contact stuff, all that's going to pop up in like the analytics profiles where like a lot of teams are going to be high on this kid. He is, he's a dude. I'm a big fan of Javante Instead Williams. of leaving to go party on a top of a car, he's going to be leaving to go to like study, a uh, banquet or a concert or, or like a, a music, a, what's I would opera? Talk about, opera. Do operas still happen? Ask Javante. Probably right, we'll ask Javante when we get him on the pod. I actually talked to him. I would encourage you to go listen back to the interview. I talked to him about that run against Miami where like trucks like six dudes. It's hilarious. Him explains like, yeah, I just don't know what was going on. Like they were just not good. All right. <laughs> um, let's go to Najee Harris of Alabama. Your running back three, which a lot of people will get upset about. How could you have Najee Harris running back three? But your running back three is still one of the better backs in this class. He is very good. And still firmly in the day two conversation. Like second round yeah. conversation for you? The Yeah, I, I think so. Late second round. I'm cool with that now. And that just comes back to the running back value. Like what he does, he does very well. He is difficult to bring down in the open field. He can win with, he can not only like run through you and stiff arm you, but he can also shake you. He's like a shift. He is a shifty or big back. Like he has all those things at his disposal. Not going to be a home run threat. Not a big play guy. Kind of similar to Eddie Lacy in that regard. Where Eddie Lacy, like if he had to run over 30 yards, that was not going to surprise. Like, that just didn't happen too much for him at the NFL level, and he was getting caught from behind. I, I think that's similar. So his biggest pro in the draft guy is actually his catch radius. That guy has very, very good hands, maybe the best hands in this draft class of any running back, and he can pluck it. Like He can adjust to passes off target. That's his biggest strength. His biggest con of speed. The comp from the draft guide is Matt Forte. Workload, not a concern. Receiving, not a concern. Just that home run ability, the fact that he is already 23 years old. Like, he looked like a man among boys because, well, kind of was a man among boys by the end of his career there. And then he played behind a really, really good offense line at Alabama. Yep. And I always like, you always feel better about the guys at running back and quarterback, the team, the play, the positions that are very reliant on someone else when they didn't have a good situation, they're doing it. Yep. When they didn't have a good offense line, when they maybe didn't have a good supporting cast quarterback, you feel better about those guys when they go above and beyond. Najee Harris had the single best offense line in the country this past year, and it wasn't even close. So that's just kind of like we always talk about, oh, you know, like going back to last year, LSU, Clyde edwards Hilaire. Is he a first-round pick if he goes to Rutgers? Is he a first-round pick if he's at no. Vanderbilt? Is he, where, where is he getting drafted? I'm going to answer uh, it right now. Yeah. If he was Rutgers, he's not going in the first no, round. No, because like you just look better when you are. So that's kind of the – he's very good. I, I just don't see him being in that elite tier where – I got a pound the table for that guy. He, last year, he ranked tied for 15th in force missed tackles per attempt at 0.28. That was right ahead of Travis Etienne, who I think finished at 0.27. Also looking at yards after contact per attempt. I always look for running backs to kind of clear that. In college, the four mark, that's where you see kind of the top 10, top 15 packs go. He finished at 3.3. Other guys where you'll you'll see with yards after contact per attempt, context very, very important because you see a guy that goes runs behind a shitty offensive line. He's going to have a lot of yards after contact per attempt because obviously he's having to make that work. So Jarrett Patterson of Buffalo, Khalil Herbert of Virginia Tech, Tyler Algier of BYU. Did you ever watch? Did you watch a lot of Algier last year? No. Dude, that running back was he's that was hashtag fun to watch tape. Algier's tape is fun to watch. The dude's like doesn't feel that athletic. Feels like just like if you put a really excited, passionate person on a football field to play running back position, and he was he was making plays. Dude, Algier, Algier was fun fun running back to watch. Javian Hawkins, too, is one of my favorites in this class. We can probably get to him later. But oh, yeah. let's now jump to Michael Carter of UNC. Can I start? I can't Go unsee ahead. Clyde Edwards-Solaire and, and Michael Carter. Oh. I, I see a lot of Clyde Edwards-Solaire and Michael Carter. Similar style. 
I wrote down Andre Ellington. I think he's faster than Clyde Edwards Hilaire. I think he's oh, a little wow. more home run. And, and on his tape, he had a lot of long runs this past year at UNC. A big reason why, you know, he had ninety one point one run grade this past year. He was very, very good. Size is still a concern. Like he is five eight two hundred. He is on the small end for the position, but his stop start ability. That's why I have his biggest pro. His cutting ability, fairly elusive. He brings a very – and he's a very good receiver as well, a very good route runner out of the backfield. So I think he is – he's close to that top tier of three, honestly. Like I, I would love to have him somewhere in the third round. If you could tell me I'd get him there, I'd be like that guy could step in right away. And like you said, Clyde Edwards, Hilaire, I don't, I don't think they're vastly different prospects in terms of like quality in my opinion. Yeah, I agree with that. All right, Kenneth Gainwell of Memphis. He's been – He's been talked about a decent amount. A lot of people yeah. like his receiving ability. Yeah, so these next two here, Kenneth Gainwell, Demetric Felton, these are two guys that we will be high on because they are very, very good receivers. They can provide a lot of value in the passing game. Both guys, I would feel more than comfortable about splitting wide as a slot receiver and letting them run routes there. Obviously, Demetric Felton did that in the Senior Bowl, and he did it very well. And Zerline had him ranked as a receiver. Yeah, so that, that's how talented I feel about these two as receivers. That's why I would covet these two for to feature if that's where you're going to feature in your passing offense. So obviously Gainwell's biggest pro. Route running size is biggest con. Listed at 5'11", 195. Now he is still young, just turned 21. There was a redshirt sophomore coming out. Opted out this past season. Comp in the draft guide, Theo Riddick. A little more athletic than Theo Riddick. Theo Riddick didn't have much of a speed. Very shifty though. That's kind of Kenneth Gainwell. Back in 2019, 51 catches. 610 yards, had over 200 yards in a game against Clemson. And he went three of four in contested catches. So Kenneth Gainwell, you need a receiving back, him or Felton, and get it done for you. RBU, Memphis. They've been Man. turning out some talent. Antonio Gibson, Kenneth Gainwell, Tony Pollard. Like He's a better, actually, and the crazy thing is Gainwell's a better wide receiver than Gibson was as a receiver. Really? Gibson sucked as a receiver. Yeah, he, he could not watch his wide receiver yeah. tape, and it's not good. He's I don't a super know what, nice guy though. Talked to him at the senior ball. That guy was really nice. I mean, he's an electric running back. He he's might be the best. He might he might be the best in that class. He's just a pure runner. I think I'm just gonna be that guy on the podcast from now on. Just nice be like, guy. hey, you know what? I, I talked to him. He's a fucking sweet dude. Any guy that's really a piece of shit that you've talked to? I can't bring up. Okay. That. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do that to people's money. You know, I don't like doing that. Wait, I never talk badly on bad interviews. Ever. Okay. Demetric Felton, wide receiver UCLA, running back UCLA, guy who like really lit it up at the senior bowl, showed he could run routes. He was also recruited to UCLA as a four star wide receiver. Yeah. And then started I think started as, as a wide receiver in twenty eighteen, mm -hmm. made the pivot to running back in twenty nineteen and twenty twenty. I've talked to him. He was on the podcast. You can go back and uh find that episode. But that's another guy with a ton of versatility. And if you're looking for a receiving back, Back end of day two, top of day three, you're making a play. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Day three time. Let's do it. I broke these down into types. I like types. You got your power backs, your kind of all arounders, and then your scat backs. And I'll say, I'll give my, give the guys, and then maybe a highlight or two of guys I like. In I'll, I'll read off the names. You just tell me your favorites. There we go. Power backs. Yeah. You got Ramondre Stevenson of Oklahoma. Trey Rack, I don't know how to pronounce this. Ragas? Ragas. Ragas is definitely not it. Not I'm going to say Ragas. Trey Ragas. Yeah. Vegas Ragas. I kind of like it. Raiders do need a back, running back. They're due. All right. Trey Ragas of Louisiana. Gary Brightwell of Arizona. And then Brian Robinson Jr. of Texas. I've seen oh, wait, no, it's, it's some Alabama. hashtag fun to watch tweets. It's Brian Robinson Jr. of Alabama. Oh, sorry. I've seen some hashtag fun to watch tweets for Brian Robinson Jr. Are you in that boat? Yes. He's... He's very good. And, and honestly, he's anywhere else in America besides Alabama the last three years with Najee Harris. And it, and he's going for like 1,600 yards. Yeah, you saw guy. that he's late getting, in the season. He's getting like 350 carries too because he is a horse himself. Like he's 6'1", 230. Like he has almost identical sort of pros and cons as a runner to Najee Harris. Not near the receiver, not even close. Um, but man, if you want a power back, him and Stevenson are my picks. I might be leaning Robinson at this point, though, because because of the the tread on the tires, just almost none. And I think he can be he created out really, really well this past year. I think he's more of a natural, like he runs a little more physical than Stevenson. Ramondre Stevenson, also graded out really well, though. Stevenson has really good feet, like the tools to do it, but I'm not sure he he like thrives with the 
physicality the way Robinson does. You talk about power backs. Obviously, Javante Williams led the country in force missed tackles per attempt. Right after that, Ramondre Stevenson at 0.36, yeah. and then Trey Regis, 0.35, number three. Then, Regis, then a boy Regis, that we'll be Regis talking about. Regis has no speed, though. That guy might run a 4.7 is the problem. Like, I think he did already run a 4.7. Did he? Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I think he might have actually, though. You should look that up while I talk about these next two backs. Mm-hmm. Future, you know, we'll talk about 2022, 2023 drafts. Number four on the force missed tackles per attempt list, Tank Bigsby of Auburn, guy that people wanted to win the Heisman at some points last year. And then guess who? Want to feel old? Frank Gore Jr. of Southern Miss, 0.34 force missed tackles per attempt last year. Frank Gore Jr. for Southern Miss Southern is going to light it up, dude. He will. He will. Look, at, look at these stats for Frank Gore Jr. 122 carries, 707 yards, 445 of which coming after contact. And then 41 missed tackles on those attempts. That dude's, That's a fucking dude right there. I'm excited to watch him more. Just told people listening to a podcast to look at these stats. What's your problem? You're banging ice on the mic on a podcast. That's even worse. You want to hate on me. All right. People Let's just get look to... at their phone. It's like, oh, were they going to pop up for me? I fucking hate myself. Uh, all around. All, right. all Ka- around backs here. Khalil Herbert, Virginia Tech, Trey Sermon, Ohio State, Kylan Hill, friend of the podcast, will be on the show soon of Mississippi State, Chuba Hubbard, Oklahoma State, and then hashtag fun to watch, baby. CJ Verdell of Oregon, and then Jamar Jefferson, Oregon State, Chris Evans, Michigan, Larry Roundtree, Missouri. A lot of all-around backs here. And Eliza Mitchell, Louisiana. These are day three all-around backs. Here's the take. On day three, I think the last back I want is an all-around back. I want someone with a specific skill set. I want someone to come in and give me... I want want a tool belt. I want a tool here. Yeah, I I agree that you're not going to chase... Like, if a guy has an all-around skill set and he's falling to day three... There's probably a reason for that. He'll be good. I mean, all it, running backs know, are pretty good. There's probably a re- like. There's probably you're not chasing high end then at that point. Yeah. You're not getting much. You're just going to get a guy who can come in and operate your offense. And and I think there's still value to that. Like I, Khalil Herbert, Trey Sermon. You tell me, I can get those guys in the you know, fifth round, fourth round. I'm Hell telling yeah. you that. You I'll can. take it. I'll take it. Like I'll take that every day of the week. That guy can come in and start for me. I think I feel good about those two. After that. I don't love the class as much. The one name I'll highlight here is Chris Evans. Has had all, got kicked out of Michigan at one point. He is a legit receiver at his size. Has some shiftiness, intriguing. Not a super high end athlete though, but he was really good in the one on ones as a receiver at the Senior Bowl. And I think he's his background is very interesting. I'm pulling yeah, up as well. And and he's got a little innate movement skills to him that not a lot of the other guys have that's like you're not going to have to spend a lot of draft capital on that guy with his career never had i think more than 100 carries honestly peaked statistically as a true freshman back in i want to say 2016 but so coming out of uh indianapolis's ben davis high school he clocked a 437 at 5 foot 11 184 pounds and i think he was like 215 though now so yeah and he was a four-star athlete recruited by all the big dogs michigan purdue illinois michigan state all that stuff uh born october 1997 a little bit of an older running back compared to some of these other guys but he also played captain america too oh he did play captain america versatility captain on accident anyway (laughs) we got range uh let's jump to the scat backs here Jarrett Patterson of Buffalo, who I think he weighed in at five foot six, two hundred. That is a unit. That is Lock. that is an absolute unit. Yeah. And then Javian Hawkins of Louisville, who has absolute juice. That guy can fly. And then Puka Williams, who, fun fact, I think he's missing all of his toes on his right foot or something. Yeah. He was like mowing the lawn when he was six or something. When he was six? I don't know. I can't remember the exact story. It was... <laughs> he could cut on a dime though. Yeah. Um Jared Patterson, probably the closest to a non-scat back. Like, Javian Hawkins, Puka Williams, those guys are tiny for the position. You you are coveting them as kind of one-trick ponies. They are not going to – you don't want them in pass protection. That's the definition of a scat back. Scat protection is not having your back pass protection. That's why you don't – they can't do that. Not going to run between the tackles. Puka Williams' vision is just like, whoo, he didn't care about the run concept. He's going to run wherever he feels like. So that's him. Hawkins, in a similar sort of mold, has a – not as shifty as Williams, but that guy can fly 4-3 speed, home run hitter. If you want that, draft Javon Hawkins probably in like the fifth round. Uh, and then Jared Patterson, like maybe you could get by as him as your like full-time back. But five foot six is small. But he's he he has like he can cut like it. He's also not super fast. Wild. Like he's five yeah. foot six, he ran a four five one. Yeah. That's just, not great. I don't. I'm not a huge fan of his. Just, nine nine broad too. Just I, mean, I just don't know what you're going to do with that. The next yeah, level. that's tough. That's really tough. I mean, um, nine nine broad. If you're that height, true. How far are you really getting? That's you know? true. No, that's true. Who's the shortest NFL player ever? 
Because I think it's in um, Trinidad Holiday was like five five. Oh, I think which that's is right. in that same ballpark. It's gotta yeah. be. Yeah. That's. I mean, but he's like he's like a thicker. He's a lot thicker than Trinidad Holiday was. He's he's a beefcake. He's a, he's a, he's a hoss. Um, what I was gonna say, Puka Williams though, it's fair to bring up. He also has some domestic violence charges that I think oh, he yeah. was. Um, freshman year. Kansas. Yeah, something. I, uh, I don't know the story fully, but he was, I think, suspended from Kansas and came back and all that stuff. So there is some of that with his game as well, his pro- his profile as well. You ready to get to the tight ends now? Yeah, let's get to the tight ends. All righty then. Day one, your number one ranked tight end is Hunter Long of Boston. No, just yeah. Kyle Pitts of Florida, a guy who, like, I think everybody on. I saw Charles McDonald. It's a race to the top. Who can feel like Kyle Pitts as a prospect harder yeah, at this yeah, point? Yeah, I, I, I saw Charles McDonald, who I think is. Twitter handles at four verts. Fantastic guy. He's been on the podcast before. I think last year's combine. He tweeted out, and this is just goes to show what draft Twitter is. This is what this is what content is about. He tweeted out watching Kyle Pitts' tape, and it was the meme of Elmo looking at an explosion, and it got thirty five hundred likes. That's what draft Twitter is. That's what the content we're trying. I'm telling you, this this is what this is why we play the game. This, the, I mean, it's fun to watch. It's fun to watch. I'm telling you, like it, that is why the barrier of entry. I'm not Charles McDonald's yeah. a fantastic analyst. I'm not saying anyway. I'm saying why I got 3,500 likes. I love the tweet. It was fantastic. I might have liked it as well. But I'm saying that is what people want with draft analysis. Honestly, both majority of people just want to say I love this guy. He's fun to watch. He's cool. I'd love to see him on my team. That's what it is. Trying to break that and be like it's actually, optimism. Yeah, this, it's, it's optimism. optimism. It's hope. Themselves. It's all that stuff. Yeah, I mean, that's what that's people want. That's what people want. That's why you love the draft. I that's why I do it. this and not serious stuff for a living. Yeah. I mean, we try and get serious sometimes and talk about positional valuation, but at the end, everyone's just like, oh, that jersey would be sick. I mean, that's what people, that elbow meme is cool. Like, that's what people want, you yeah. know? Hashtag fun to watch. It's Kyle Pitts, biggest pro. I just move the way he moves. Like that guy, you, you can't teach a six foot, not, not even just like Ethel, like his raw testing numbers, which it hasn't had his pro yet, but I assume will be very good. But like how he goes about his business. Like that guy could have been... A uh, high-level basketball player probably could have played baseball. He can just do whatever. He's that very natural athlete that is just gifted. And for being 6'5", 245, maybe in the 250 range at this point is different. Biggest cons just his size. He was listed at 240. Obviously, he's still only 20 years old, so your human beings can get bigger. And to be that big already is a good start. So I do think he'll end up getting there. Uh, the comp is Darren Waller. Even I don't even love that because I think he's a better. I think he'd be better than Darren Waller. Uh, but you think he's gonna be better than Darren Waller? Yeah, the top three tight end in the NFL. Yeah, damn. Um, What's your take on him going before any receiver in this class? Ball skills and Waller. Whew. Again, it depends on it. Are you going to utilize him in the in your offense? If you do, I think he can be more valuable than any yeah. receivers in this class. I'm working on a mock draft for Monday, and I have him going ahead of all the receivers. Mm. Nice. I mean, you when you factor in positional scarcity, it's like, fuck. You know, like t- Kyle Pitts, like you said, if Kyle Pitts, you're saying, and I trust your opinion, I like you. Hmm. <laughs> Do you? If you're saying he's... You played Beard Eye without me, so you, obviously you, not You're like, much. I comped him to Darren Waller, but he's going to be better than Darren Waller. It's like, okay, so you're telling me he's going to be the number three tight end in the NFL. Because Darren Waller is, I would say, comfortably yeah. the number three tight end in the NFL. I don't think it's... Especially at the tight end Can you end stop position. also banging the fucking ice on your mic, please? I... I have a very serious stomach issue going on. Sometimes I need to drink to settle my stomach. All right. Okay, if you could fill your cup with not seventy five ice, ice cubes, that'd be um, great. But yeah, I don't. I don't want to say Kyle Pitts. Jeez, I don't want to say tight ends not that difficult to scout. Obviously, the NFL has been sucking at it. But when you have that level of physical ability that Pitts does, you got a really high floor. You know, it's because you're not because a lot of what you're doing at the tight end position is not necessarily winning one on one, which he's already shown you can do. But also it's just like your ball skills and, and catch radius and stuff like that. And he has that knocked out. Like he has shown that yeah. better than any tight end prospect. And that's what we worry about tight end prospects. They don't get featured. How is he going to fare when he has to do that? It's like, no, Kyle Pitts was a glorified, you know, small forward last year on his tape with how many rebounds he had to pull out the air from Kyle Trask. He went 25 of 45 and contested catches in his career. The wow. guy is battle tested in that regard and he is passed with flying colors i have a perfect follow-up here kyle pitts has been hyped up to the point it's been insane i mean if he doesn't pan out it'll be go down as like one of the biggest busts in nfl draft history just based on how hyped he yeah. is how, how does it go wrong how does it go wrong for kyle pitts it goes to the wrong situation okay like i said if someone doesn't want to utilize him in such a regard that is favorable like if 
If you're not gonna, if you're gonna, if you're gonna have them running the Jason Witten route tree in your offense, which is option routes five to ten yards down the football field, it, it might not be, you know, that might not be his best usage. You might not get your money's worth there if you're drafting them top ten. Yeah. That's the only way I can see it. Usage and situation, I do think, is yeah. how it doesn't work with Kyle Pitts. Or, I mean, like, obviously off-field is always kind of the concern, but he has no, he literally has no off-field concerns. Like, that would, off-field injury, whatever, those can obviously derail your career. He has no reason to think those are problems. You don't see an Isaiah Wilson-like future for Kyle Pitts? I don't. Not that do, I say. So, okay, I have a question. Once, I, we once haven't he gets some money in your pocket, Wilson's. though, $6 million signing bonus for Wilson, that... You can have a lot of fun with that. I, you don't got to tell me. I mean, you do actually. I don't know what it's like to have six million dollars in your pocket. Maybe your dad does. Um, but I have a question on. Okay, so there's a range of outcomes for every player. There's a certain range of outcomes for how bad his off field will be. Given interviews that you've had with Isaiah Wilson, there's no way they came out of those interviews. Given what we've seen happen, that they weren't like, well, there is a chance this guy completely falls off the rails. They had to have thought that, right? There's no way you come out of multiple interviews yeah. with Isaiah Wilson and you spend a first round pick on him talking to his coaches, his teammates, all that stuff. And you didn't come out of it like there was a 0% chance he is shirtless out front of a strip mall in a car in, in a month, missing voluntary workouts with his second team. I feel like the percentage chance for that was high and they just said, fuck it. And then didn't do enough to support him. I'm blaming the Titans still. A lot of Titans fans blame Isaiah Wilson. I'm still blaming the Titans. Sorry. Oh wow. I just, I just there's like I was search. I just searched Isaiah Wilson red flags, and there's a article that says Isaiah Wilson red flags none. Oh man. I mean, was there no red flags? Dude. I don't know. I, oh, again, it's actually, it's actually from the Draft Network. They, their red flags says none. Well, I doubt it. <laughs> I know. Right? I doubt it. Either way, I, I still blame the Titans. I think Titans fans, because they're fans of the Titans, are blaming Isaiah Wilson. It was just never going to work with him. I don't know. I think you got to either do your due diligence or know that this is possible and know that Isaiah Wilson's teetering on this, at least something close to it, and you got to help him out. All right, day two, let's get back to the tight ends here. Yeah. You have Pat Fryermuth of Penn State as the number two tight end in this class. Yeah, he's never going to be It's never going to be Cal Pitts. He doesn't, doesn't move like that. He's not going to be Kelsey. He's not going to be Kittle. But he, the, the things that more traditionally tight ends did in the past and that contest the catches, physical after the catch, inline blocking, he does those really well. And, and I think he is can still make plays after the catch, but it's more he gets upfield and starts stiff-arming guys left and right. That's going to be how he wins. I, I think he's a very good, just kind of – solid tight end. You're, he will be your starter, and you're not going to complain too much about him being your starter. I'd put him in a similar tier as TJ Hawkinson. Yeah. I but I wouldn't draft I, him number eight TJ overall. Hawk, as prospects, 100%. He's in a similar tier to me as TJ Hawkinson. Um, I, also, I, did, I don't know. I didn't think you mentioned this, but he's a really good no, blocker. No, no one should draft TJ Hawkinson eighth overall is the yeah. other thing. Yeah. So, yeah. But uh, I feel like he's a really good blocker as well. Yeah, that's you, the inline ability. Like, he's just a safe, safe guy. Brevin Jordan, Miami, also friend of the podcast. Fun guy. I can tell he's going to be a locker room guy. He's a fun guy to talk to. We had a lot of fun on that interview, even before and after talking about random shit. But Brevin Jordan, I've made not the comp, but I feel like a good comparison for him. You have Clay Harbor, who you're just best friends with from the Bastard or whatever. What about Gerald Everett? From a usage standpoint, I could see him being used similarly to Gerald Everett. Yeah, Everett was smaller, I'd even say, than okay. Jordan. Everett was kind of more like he'll shaky after the catch. Jordan's still... Got some explosiveness and some uh, power to his game after the catch. And he's another guy who now he's only he's twenty. He's only twenty. He's another young tight end. Twenty-one broken tackles on one hundred five catches throughout his career, and probably like a four fives guy. Like he has that speed that can be a weapon. And I think so much of tight end today and so much of tight end production, like it is just speed based. It is crossing routes, flat routes. Overs, seams. It's like yak based. Too. That's just that's that's just speed. You you don't have to be. You don't. You can have the most dog shit route running ability in the world. You can run those routes if you're a four or five guy, and uh, that's going to be that's kind of Brem Jordan. He's not special as a route runner. His ball skills are actually kind of kind of very iffy. He went four of nineteen on contested catches the past couple of years. He is not physical and does not attack the ball well to catch point, but. If you run that sort of offense that, you know, the play action, the Shanahan tree of offenses, he he can be very valuable in your offense. I will say this. Still needs to develop his run. Gerald Everett came out six foot three, two forty, ran a four six. 
Mm-hmm. Brevin Jordan is six foot three, two forty five, and you're saying could run in the four fives. Yeah, I think it's similar. I don't think I yeah. hate the comp as much. I don't hate. No. All right, Tommy Tremble, Notre Dame comes in at number four for you. I, you know, Tommy Tremble, tight end. It's this is a you don't want to talk about usage being an important factor of Tommy Tremble's success. If you use Tommy Tremble effectively, use him as almost an H back fullback in some ways. Like he yeah. could be damn good for your football team. Yeah, I think he's better. So the, the first fullback off the board last year was Josiah Deguara, since he's own. Uh, to the Packers in the third round, he's a better fullback than Josiah Deguara, and still shouldn't go in the third round. No, he's, he could probably go in the third round because okay. he's. I'm not taking him in the third round. One, only 20 years old. Another young guy. Love that. Declared early. He is fast. Uh, maybe not four or fives fast, but I'd say four sixes. And he is. I knew. I was not surprised zero line was high in him because I knew O line guys were going to kick their pants over this guy's tape. It is as good a run blocking tape as you'll see from a guy H back move sort of player. He is electric, man. I, I, he's the highest blocking tight end run blocking grade among tight ends in the country last year. Production is a concern. Not a, again, not a great route runner, not going to necessarily get open a zone, but he can do those straight line routes because he is fast. You can outrun a linebacker, a slower linebacker for sure. So there's a, there's a easy, easy path to success for Tremble on NFL football field for only 20 years old, man. He can, he can get even bigger, a little stronger. Whew. Excited. Excited. Get All right, excited. Hunter Long of Boston College coming in at what? Tight end six here? Five. Tight end five, Hunter Long. Guy was a big contested catch guy, dude. He graded really well for PFF, and you grade you can grade really well based off efficiency, like making taking advantage of each target, taking advantage of each route, but also you show up in contested catch situations like Hunter Long did last year, mm-hmm. you're going to grade really well in PFF system. This is, this is it at the time session. You want a tight end that you could start day one, I think this is about it. This is the last guy. You no here, here. Can I rephrase that? You want a tight end that you won't replace next in the next offseason. Yeah, you're gonna need. You sign two think guys about to replace. I mean, think how quickly you replace tight ends. I mean, if they, if you draft one in day three, like some of these other guys we're gonna name, it's like it's gonna be listed as a need for you next year. Like yeah. that for a fact. You draft, you know, uh, Yaboa, Bates, Boys State. It's gonna be listed as a need for you next year for yeah. sure. So Hunter Long, very good ball skills. The comp here is Hunter Henry. Like you're not chasing super high end, but he is just gonna be solid he can work the middle of the field has good ball skills can work the red zone i mean receiving grades of 86.6 in 2019 83.2 this past year had 89 targets this past year was actually featured actually productive things you don't often see from college tight ends so you feel safer about his translation in the nfl he just every single guy above him on this list is a better athlete i think he is kind of he is your baseline of athleticism for starting tight end in the nfl maybe a little bit above necessarily the baseline i don't think he's kyle rudolph where kyle rudolph was like that dude's slow he could still get kind of past linebackers a little bit but you're just not you're not expecting super high end out of hunter long but he's a good tight end like that's these five tight ends he said you're gonna draft tight end make it one of these five after this there are two guys that i would point to on day three that i'll say i'm intrigued but that's it so go, I'm ahead, a go ahead and list. Go ahead and list. I'm a tree. Can you replay that, Quinn, just a couple of times? Bro, we don't have to. We really don't. I'm a tree. All right, day three. Sorry that I do voice inflection over here. I care about making this. Don't fun drink to, fun the to fucking watch. ice water, please. You are my nightmare. You are why I drink. All right, Pro Wells, TCU, day three tight end. Trey McKitty of Georgia. Tony Poljan, Virginia. Briley Moore, Kansas State. Kyle Granson, SMU. Kenny Yaboa, Ole Miss. And then John Bates, Boise State. Those are your day three likely going to replace these guys a year following if you pick them. All right, two guys that I'm intrigued about <laughs> are Pro Wells, TCU. Didn't play a ton. Are you just TCU. name scouting? Because that name is sick. It's a cool name. I might, may, I might has... name my kid Pro. He is. Is this really incont- He is a long arms, six five, can jump, and like when he is in contested situations, the guy is very good. Like his, he can actually be a weapon on fades. Like he can actually do that very well. That I think that's an interesting skill set to have on day three, where you're not really. He played basically slot receiver in TCU's offense. Was not in line. Isn't terribly athletic, but he can jump and is physical at the catch point. That's an intriguing skill set. And the other one's Briley Moore, Kansas State. Transfer after four years at Northern Iowa. One of the best 
blockers at this point in the draft. One of the best blockers kind of just like of anyone in the draft. He's he's a good inline blocker, can hold up there. And then he runs a 4.66, 37.5 inch vertical, 10.3 broad jump. Some intriguing explosive testing numbers. I don't think he's a supernatural receiver, but athleticism is kind of like 90% of, like I said, getting open in the NFL at the tight end position. And so he has that more than a lot of these other day three tight ends. I remember the name Pro Wells for more than it just being awesome. When I wrote the background, listen to these numbers. In high school, at Florida's Dixie Highlands High School, he got 31 passes his senior year for 952 yards. That's 30 yards a catch. Damn. That's insane. And then he did. He played basketball too. I mean, he was like six foot five. Had to, um, and had only had offers from Akron and Bowling Green coming out as a no star recruit. Then took a prep year, which I'm finding as they do more of these backgrounds, a lot of people do take a prep year. Milford Academy. Then he went to Northwestern Mississippi Community College and then transferred to TCU. But dude, that stat line is fucking insane. Thirty one passes for nine hundred fifty two yards. Just like every pass he caught was a bomb. I mean, yeah. I, that's that's nuts, man. That's really so he cool. ran a four eight three at his pro day. So he's, he's not a big fast, dog too, but, but he's he can big. Hop, yeah. yeah. All right, that's going to do it for the running back and tight end positional overview. What a podcast. Lance Zerline rankings, running backs and tight ends. A lot of fun stuff. Going to continue our positional overviews with offensive line next time. Hell yeah. Let's do offensive line. I'm excited about that. We're also doing bonus mailbag this week. Going to record it tomorrow. We have, okay, so update on the mailbag. 96 questions remaining, pressing, through March 10th, I think. Then another 75 or so through March 20th. So we're about 150 back. We might do two bonus episodes. I know tomorrow's going to be a 90-minute banger. We're going to do bonus episodes until we catch up. I think we're close. I think we're going to get there. If you want to get on a mailbag in 2025, please jump on Apple Podcasts, leave a five-star review, rate the podcast, leave your question there, and we will get to it in a future year, potentially, but we're excited to do it. Uh, Let's now go ahead and jump to those interviews with Michael Carter, running back of North Carolina, and then Marvin Wilson, defensive tackle, Florida State. Now joining the 2 for 1 Drafts podcast is former UNC running back Michael Carter. And honestly, one of the, my favorite interviews we've had on the books. I'm really looking forward to talking to you. I talked to your former teammate, fellow, fellow backfield compadre in Javante Williams. He spoke really highly of your game. And you're coming to us live from one of the prettiest sites in Miami. Can you show everyone the view here? I need to see that view again because it just looks yeah, insane. Man. Yeah, let me show you all, man. <laughs> I'm here in Cincinnati in this dirty studio. Oh, my gosh. People are jealous. I'm jealous. You're living the dream, <laughs> dude. Out here living the dream. But I, I know you're training down there in Miami. Originally, you're originally from Pensacola, but you're training in Miami. How's that been so far? It's been good. I've just been able to get away and work. This is like my first true love, so I'm not <laughs> that's, here. That's awesome, man. Are you working out with any of the other prospects in this class? Are you making any friends there? Yeah, definitely. Um, just um, my group of running backs that I've been training with, Deion Jackson from Duke, Jamie Hawkins. And uh, Jake Funk and Jared Patterson and Tommy Trumbull and Zach Davidson. So that's cool. been the that's been the the group. Dude, Javion Hawkins, just to talk about him for a little bit, that guy's got some juice. He can fly. His tape is crazy. I was really yeah. impressed with him coming out of Louisville. I'm sure that guy's been fast as you've trained. How has the you know training been? Obviously, you probably have your pro day circled and are looking forward to doing all the drills when you can. But are there any specific drills that you're prioritizing, like ones that you really feel like you need to nail? Any of them circled like that? Any goal times in mind? Uh, yeah, they're all important to me. I got my goals, but. I want that shock value on the 29, so I'm going to keep it under wraps for now. But Fair enough. Uh, I just want to show what I put on tape, that I can run, catch, um, that you know I'm athletic, I can jump, and I can change direction. I just want to show all of them. Awesome, man. Very cool. Well, and what weight did you play at this past season at UNC? And are you dieting heavy? Are you working towards any weight goals right now based off feedback from teams or anything? Yeah, so I played all my games at 200, a couple games over 200, but – um, the the roster, it was it was stupid because I was like 199 on the roster, but it was like because of weigh-in day, you know, it was one of those weigh-in days, and I was like all the way 200 pounds, and that's just what they put. But mm-hmm. no, nah, I mean I'm I'm 200, I'm solid 200, and I've been just trying to like lose body fat, so I've been doing that down here. Um, don't laugh at me, but I was like I was probably like 10, percent but I'm down, I'm like six right now, seven, so I'm getting like you know where I should be. 
Dude, not laughing over here, dude. 10% is a dream. <laughs> Probably like closer to 20%, <laughs> but uh, whatever that may be. That's cool that you're staying at 200, though. I talked to some guys who have to like cut like 30 pounds and 5% body fat. It's good that you're not in that bad of a position, especially down there in Miami where you know everyone talks about the beaches and the clubs, the women. The food in Miami is underrated, man. It is so damn good in Miami. I hope you're enjoying that maybe after your pro day, whenever that is. Um, let's move to kind of you know your, your career at UNC and talk specifically about this past season and just the insane year that both you and Javante had running the football for UNC. Did you feel like you really broke out this year or really was it just opportunity? Like finally opportunity met with the skill set you've always had. Uh, just me, me personally, I feel like, I mean, I had a thousand yards my junior year, so I feel like I got to really like, you know, officially break out last year and um, Vontae's, you know, real breakout deal was this year. And I feel like for me just personally, um, I got to finish, you know, what I started in terms of legacy because I, I went there for four years and, and to be honest, like, ever since I got there, I've made an impact on the field. And so just wanting to, like, really, like, I grew up wanting to, you know, be one of the best in college football and uh, be known as that. And so I feel like however way it happened, you know, whether it was, you know, on my own or as a duo, man, I feel like we we did that. So, I mean, I'm just happy to be a part of the history book. Yeah, I mean, production has come easy to you even since high school there at Navarre High School in Florida. You rushed for, what, 3,345 all-purpose yards total. That's total yards and 45 touchdowns. And then even in 2018, averaged 7.1 yards per carry across, across 84 attempts, over 1,000 yards in each of the past two years. One of the more productive backs in this class. Something that PFF sees in addition to that production, in addition to the force miss tackle ability and the grading, is that you really do have that stop-start ability that, you know, those oily hips in and out of your cuts that really separates kind of backs of your caliber backs of your size do you feel like that production and that stop start ability is your key strength something that kind of separates you in this class or what do you feel like is your best trait what separates you put the scouting hat on for me okay we'll put it on so i feel like um along with the you know the stop and start ability um something that i feel like it came pretty natural to me but i've also worked on you know really hard um i feel like patience and vision are two things that um really separate me. You know, some guys can see the hole, but not all of them can get to it. Some guys can get to it, not all of them can see, and I feel like I can do both. So I feel like that's what makes me a little bit different. Yeah, absolutely. One of the comparisons that we have, you know, for you is Andre Ellington, which is kind of an older back in the NFL. But something I see from recent running backs that have been drafted that's kind of similar to your game, and I'm just going to throw a comp at you. Don't get disrespected here. But LSU's Clyde edward Tolaire, who was kind of a similar frame, had that similar force miss tackle ability, could catch out of the backfield. Those are two names that come to mind when I watch your game. Who do you feel like your game compares to, or do you even have any, like, comparisons in mind? Uh, I mean, I don't have no comparisons. I really kind of live it to y'all, but... Um... I feel like just in terms of like, you know, making people miss and uh, running ability. I mean, I watch a lot of guys to try to learn from them. So, I mean, I watch, of course, I'm going to watch Alvin and uh, McCaffrey just because they catch the ball well. And uh, uh, Dalvin Cook, my personal favorite, though, to be honest. Um, and Aaron Jones is, is right up there, too. And people people disrespect Aaron Jones, and he's one of the best backs in the league, and I don't, I don't really feel he, should, he deserves that type of disrespect, but um, he does so much good stuff, and um, so I just feel like I watch all of them, man. I, like, I love football, so uh, the comparisons, I feel like that's your job. My job is to do football. <laughs> Fine. Team comparisons to me. I think Aaron Jones, I agree, one of the best backs in the NFL. Also a guy that's going to get paid a ton of money this offseason now that he's a free agent, maybe moving away from the Green Bay Packers. Another thing I want to talk about, you brought up film. You know, What film are you watching or what are you do, looking for on film when you're preparing for a certain opponent in a given game week? You know, When you're turning on the film and looking at a defense, what is going through your mind that you want to watch out for or prepare for on film? Yeah, so I watch you know, how, how linebackers blitz. Um, their demeanor when they're about to blitz, safety rotation. Um, see if they have any, you know, freaks on their on their side of the ball. Um, just and just just understanding like how their defense moves as one, um, how they how they move to the ball, how they flow to the ball. Because I feel like you can tell if a team is good or not by like you know, their backside corner pursuit, you know, stuff like that, like effort, you know. So um, I just like to see how teams play, and then you know the other stuff kind of falls into place, like you know, explosive run and cut up. Um, how do other guys get, you know, break loose against the team that we're playing? Um, so there's a lot of stuff. There's so much film out there, man. So, yeah. you know, it was our answers to the test. 
Absolutely. I mean, I think you're the first person that kind of looked for effort and looked for backside pursuit in those things. I think a lot of people look for other tendencies, but I find that very interesting. I think that's something that more people should look for. I think that is how you can kind of tell which how defenses work and how well they're coached in those things. I want to bring up, you know, Javante a little bit. I talked to him earlier. He was on this podcast a few weeks ago or a few days ago. And, you know, you had Daniel Jeremiah of NFL Network saying he could be the first running back off the board. And I know you said this is our job, but I'd love to hear from your perspective what Javante does so well and why he's so coveted in this class. Yeah, I think um, for one is is that he's only you know he's twenty, and I feel like when you get to the I'm a football head, so like I, I understand you know like you got a you got a guy that's, that's twenty years old and 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 moves that the way he does and has already shown you know his ability and he was a valedictorian of his class, so he's not he's gonna have any trouble learning the playbook, but just like the way that he's able to he's able to not go down. You know, and he kind of just, it almost just seems like he never breaks stride when he runs. I mean, he can make you miss, but he'd rather just kind of just run in a straight line. That's the fastest way to the end zone. So um, he just he just bounces off tackle. Um, he can stiff arm you. He, he can run you over. He can make you miss. He can outrun you. And I think that's what's so crazy about him. It's just like, you ask him, he wouldn't even, you wouldn't even, you ask him, he wouldn't even know. You know, like he just like, well. I guess that's what happened, but um, it's so crazy because he just – he's a great guy too, so, I mean, if he's the first running back taken, man, I'm his biggest fan, man. But, uh, I know he would do the same for me. That's awesome, man. That's very cool. I, I mean, you spoke to the valedict- valedictorian, and when I talk to him, I feel like you get that presence about him, a very smart dude who, who, like you said, is a very good person. Where does that show up in the locker room or in the huddle? You know, I'd be interested to hear more about because everyone knows, you know, Javante Williams is this bigger back that's like got Marshawn Lynch runs on his tape, especially against Miami, and so do you. That Miami game, by the way, we have to talk about that. I mean, that Miami game was one of the best games for a running back tandem probably in college football history, and I feel like I talked to Javante. He was kind of humble about it, but you guys had to be on the sideline like is Miami Hurricanes gonna burn this tape because it was one of the one of the (laughs) hardest things to watch if like for that Miami defense before I talk more about Javante I'd love to hear like your opinion of that game and kind of what it was like on the sidelines what it was like you know in the locker room after that game just knowing how badly you won on the ground with you and Javante yeah I think I think it's wild because before the game you know it was just kind of like the last one of the season and we had hard rock me and Vontae, I was just like, man, like, I feel good, man. It's warm <laughs> down here. And he was like, man, me too. Like, Vontae is not, like, so quiet, like, you know, as he, as he gives off. He's, you know, he's a vocal guy. He just, he has his own way of doing it. He knows how to talk to people you know, in his way. So, um, I mean, people look to Vontae um, just like they, you know, look to myself. I feel like our whole running back room has leadership in it. And, um, you know, he's, he's the guy on the team that, that guys really look to and um, really believe in. You know, so that game, it was that game. It was like, wow, man, we about to go off. We we sweating. It's not even game time yet. It's like <laughs> 70, 80 degrees. Like, finally, we get a game that you know it's not cold in December. So we was feeling good. And I was like, bro, we about to go off. He's like, yeah, fact. And, <laughs> and then as soon as like my first run of the game, we ran you know outside zone, and their defensive end was just running straight up the field. I was like, okay, well, uh, I mean, they'll probably adjust. And then they did it. And then, <laughs> like, we get to the – I think we got to, like, the second quarter. And we already we both already had 100 yards. And we were just like, wow. That's crazy. They should do something about that. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then you know, my running back coach was just like, man, like, you know, restart every time we score. It was just like, start over, start over. And then, like, it got to the point where it was like, what are we doing this? Like, we're really doing this. We both got 200 yards. And then from there, we just like, man, let's go. So, like, we, it was just like, man, how, how far can we take it? So, but it was just like, me and him, my both were just like, oh, we don't, we're not like, you know, cocky guys. We just like, I can't believe this is happening. Like, whoa, this is crazy. We're literally like looking at each other like, I mean, okay. that had to have been insane. <laughs> I mean, so, and it's funny that you brought it up, was, you like, know, a good day overall. And not to mention, Diami had like 150 yards on like three catches. So, like, that makes it easier, too. 
And, and it's funny that you brought up too, like the defensive end, you know, rushing too far upfield. The thing I took away most was like the safeties, like the safeties angles, the safeties tackling. Like it was when you guys got to the second, third level, it was game. It was, and you guys were getting yeah. there so quickly because of obviously defensive line playing out of line, you know, you know not staying in their lanes and those things. Like that was mm-hmm. one of those games where, like I said, like Miami, burn the tape, fellas. Burn the tape. Um, I don't want to keep too much of your time. I'd love to finish with this. And I, I think I ask a lot of prospects this question. It's always a good answer. But, you know, what really is your your motivation or your why for pursuing the game at the level you do? Making the sacrifices that you have to make to play running back at the collegiate level and then pursue it in the NFL and do all that you do on and off the field to continue to play this game? Yeah, I play football because, well, for one, it's fun. Like, I really enjoy playing. And it's like the only thing that, like the the feeling that I get from football, I don't get anywhere else. And it's one of them. It's one of them. It's one of those things where you can't hide who you really are. And I like that about football. So, um, just being in the locker room with the with the guys and just being able to you know have a relationship and really like get to know people on a different level. Like and it comes from like you know all walks of life, and that's what makes it special. So I I play because it's fun. Um, the the brothers in the locker room and then. Now that like I'm here, um, I never really. I mean, it was always my goal to, you know, make it to the NFL. But now that I'm right here, like this is a dream come true. So, uh, why stop now? I mean, I feel like the dream come true, and you know, I'm gonna keep dreaming. Why stop now? I love that, man. That's awesome. Really appreciate the time, man. I wish you the best of luck moving forward. Appreciate you, man. Now joining the Two Four Drafts podcast is former Florida State defensive tackle Marvin Wilson. PFF, big fan of your game for a long time now. It's great to have you on the show. Yes, sir. It's great to be here. So you're down there in Fort Worth training for your, obviously, upcoming pro day. How has that been so far? Well, it's been great, you know, since I've been out here. Uh, knocked off about a good 20 pounds since I've been out. Been out here, gotten faster, stronger, you know. Been, it's been a great time being out here, but just, just really just chasing my dreams. Man, 20 pounds. What, what, what weight did you play at this past season? Well, this past season, I played like 315, 316, you know, and all my – when I got injured, I gained like a couple pounds, like five to 10 pounds, you know, so I came in at like 320 something. So I ended up uh, getting down right now, I'm weighing at like 305, 304. And have teams asked you to get down to a certain number or are you just like comfortable playing at 305? Um, honestly, it's just like for some weird reason, there's been like a lot of speculation that I've been, I played heavy, like like heavier than 310, 315, or well, that hasn't been the case of at Florida State besides my freshman year. So um. <laughs> Really, really, I'm just getting down just for me, you know, just to kill all the speculation for some weird reason of people saying that I've always played heavy. So, you know, just uh, really just put the extra incentive out there. Gotcha. Makes sense, man. And are there any specific drills that you're prioritizing? I know, like, you're obviously preparing for all of them and hoping to blow them out at your pro day, but are there any ones that you're kind of circling saying, like, hey, this is the drill where I really got to show up? Um, really not. Not really, honestly. Just me. Just uh, I'm very well-rounded, so it's different drills for a fact. I know for a fact uh, that I just want really just put up like great numbers at you know whether it be uh, 225, whether it be the 40, you know honestly over my 10 yard split, you know really just for my size, the times I feel like I'm going to run, it's going to be pretty uh pretty interesting, you know and really just my uh three cone drills, uh, five ten five, you know I'm really excited to go out go out there show really what I can do, and then it comes down to just uh we'll go to our drills, you know it's just playing football to me, you know so those those probably not going to be a problem at all. Gotcha, man. And I want to look previously back at this season now and talk about kind of, you know, this whole season that went down for Florida State. I feel like, you know, with the abbreviated offseason, COVID-19, how much did kind of COVID play an impact on, you know, your progress and your 2020 campaign? Because I feel like I've seen you, you in 2018, 2019 graded really, really well for PFF, but that you just didn't see that same level of success from you in 2020. And really from anyone, you know, at, at Florida State and a lot of other players in college, how different was this 2020 season for you? Yeah, we, we had a lot of different things that took, we had a lot of different things that took place at Florida State uh, this uh, this past year, especially when COVID hit. You know, um, having a new coach staff come in, then having COVID been off from four to five months, not to even get really know the new staff, really getting no getting the playbooks and things like that. You know, so that's uh, put us behind the eight ball huge, tremendously. And then me personally, a couple other guys on our team who had went through under went, went under surgery those past uh, that after that past season with delayed our rehab and different things like that. So, you know, a lot of people were behind the eight ball going into the season, you know, and um, so um, it was really, we always really playing a catch up game, you know, in a sense. So we was all trying to uh, get back on track, you know, um, with just with different uh, struggles that came through, you know, put everybody behind, behind the ball. So, you know, um, 
We tried our hardest, came out, fought every single day. But, you know, we just came up a real short in a lot of different things. But it was just things that was out of, out of control. And how was the experience you had down there at the Senior Bowl? I know you had an opportunity to go down there and play in Mobile. What was some of the feedback you got from coaches? And what were some kind of key takeaways you took away from that experience? Um, everybody, for me personally, just wants me to see me come out and compete. You know, honestly, uh, especially me uh, undercover, um, undergoing meniscus surgery this past uh, November and was into my season uh, uh, shortly. So I um, cut it short. So they really just want to see me come out and see if I was helping. You know, I came out, competed, you know, competed. Did uh, two days at the Senior Bowl, competed well. Came out, just showed what, everybody what I really can do. You know, that I was back moving around healthy and things like that. And, and do you feel like that now kind of going through this offseason process, where do you feel like your biggest strengths are? What do you feel like really separates you in this class? Because PFF really sees your power and your play strength and how you win with your hands and, and that punch being like – the biggest part of your game or the biggest, the strongest part of your game. But what do you feel like is your biggest strength and that kind of separator in this class? Uh, me, I feel like I play harder than anybody else. You know, I feel like uh, me and I have so much versatility, you know, same, same, you come on the film from different years at Florida State. I play anything from a zero to a five and I've been able to play it really well, you know, and I just play hard, you know, that's, that's how, what got me on my field, on the field when I was in little league. And that's what's going to get me on the field. The next level is me I'll playing I play the people that I'm playing against or I'm in competition with to get on the field with. So I just have that motor uh, that, to keep going that nobody else has. Walk me through what a given game week looks like you looks for looks like for you on film. What are you looking for on film from an opposing offensive lineman or opposing offense as you prepare for an opponent? Um, when I study film, I break down. I really uh, – the first thing I start to look at is offensive lineman thing difference between run and pass. You know, um, that's the first biggest key that's going to help me uh, play, uh, break down and make plays. You know, being able to separate the two uh, when a when lineman is leaning forward or when he's sitting back. You know, those two those two things really help me get off the ball and make plays. So, um, off, uh, off the rip, that's definitely what I'm looking for first. Then I'm looking at backfield sets. You know, what plays they like to run out of uh, running back here, uh, where, whether it's level, where it's behind, uh, at home, whether it's uh, is a little, little far back in the backfield. Do they like running inside zone, outside zones? You know, different things like that. So, first of all, I, my first couple of uh, – first is just to see – run a pass, then I'm starting to look at the top run, run plays, and after that, now it's just um, the passes, are there a sliding team or man man side or really a zone scheme. So, you know, really just uh, break down the opponent, opponent comes from those three things for me. Uh, that's how I really break down my opponent throughout the weeks. Something I love to talk to pass rushers about is like their pre-snap pass rush plan. What exactly, you know, goes through your head pre-snap when you're setting up pass rush moves or working counters and those things? How is your pass rush plan built and what pass rush moves do you lead with and counter with? Um, it all starts off uh, knowing what side are you on. Am I on the man side or the zone side? You know, um, really that really helps me knowing what, uh, what, what move could, uh, help me work. Am I, on a, what, am, I, am I on a man side where I can have a two-way go or I'm on a zone side uh, where I have to really just stay in my gap or, or I'm gonna, if I work kind of, I'm going to be expecting the guy coming to help. So, you know, that start, that start, that's number one, which is um, knowing personnel and recognize where you are on the field. And uh, from there, that's when uh, it goes down. I'm on a man side. I know I can, that's when I can work my jabs and over, over-unders and things like that where I have the two-way go. Now, if I'm on the zone side, that's when I would just uh, – Really run up field, work my club reps, my bull snatch, and things, things of that uh, such. And how has your film preparation kind of changed in the off season? Are you watching a lot of film on yourself, or are you watching film on NFL guys at all? Um, really, I'm watching film on myself. You know, it's really just seeing how I can take myself to another level. So you know, just really breaking down myself and uh, understanding my uh, my weaknesses, and at the same time making my strengths a lot stronger. You know, so uh, learn how things I can build off of. And the best thing for me right now is I got a lot of things I can work, work on, which is great for me because the worst thing for me to be at this process to be tapped out. Totally, man. And now kind of this last question, I'd love to you know ask prospects about this. What do you feel like is your motivation to kind of continue to pursue football? You know, how much do you love football? And, and, and what are some of the motivations for why you put yourself through so much sacrifice to you know pursue football at this level? Um, one is um, – one, definitely um, – is I would just be going back and looking at old pictures, and it's just me. I always had a football around, you know. Football has always been my it was, it been my first love. I always fell in love with football since I've been a little kid. I used to carry football around my house, you know, when I was two, three years old. You know, um, that's when that's that's when the love started developing. And the second thing is, is for my family. You know, um, I always dreamed of being one day being the breadwinner of my family and really just being able to be that big provider. You know, now I have a chance to actually go out there and pursue my dreams and be the uh, be the breadwinner of my family. So, you know, that's definitely my two whys. You know, I fell in love with the game just, just in, in general, just loving the game and playing it. Then uh, having the opportunity to provide for my family, just add that extra incentive for what I do, what I do. 
Fantastic, man. Well, I really appreciate you jumping on the podcast, and I wish you the best of luck moving forward. Good. Thank you. Appreciate you guys having me. That's going to do it for this episode of Two for One Drafts. Make sure you rate and review the podcast. Leave your mailbag question for a future mailbag. Austin Gale, producer Mike Quinn, producer Dave Sofaro, and Mike Renner, Two for One Drafts.